Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to be taking you guys back to the year in 1968 to look at the classic Charlton Heston movie Planet of the Apes. So let's saddle up the horse, let's go have a look at the trailer and I'll see you guys soon. Can't help thinking that somewhere in the universe there has to be something better than man. Has to be. The words are Charlton Heston's. Get out a last signal to Earth that we've landed! The world he finds out in the galaxy will challenge every idea you've ever had of civilization. A planet where man is the lowest order of living things. And the superior beings are apes. They build the cities, make the laws, the gods, and control the guns that hunt a race of lowly, terrified humans who run wild in the jungles, are caged in the prisons, and stuffed in the museums. 20th Century Fox transforms the motion picture screen into Planet of the Apes. Pierre Boulle's finest novel since Bridge on the River Kwai. The world gone insane. An upside down civilization that could not be real. Yes, a world of madness and terror. Man has no understanding. He can be taught a few simple tricks, nothing more. His brain, you funny baboon! It's a man! It's a man! Planet of the Apes, beyond your wildest dreams. And welcome back guys. So the synopsis for this film is an astronaut crew crash lands on a planet in the distant future where intelligent talking apes are the dominant species and humans are oppressed and enslaved. It's got a 112 minute runtime and it's classed as an adventure sci-fi. It was directed by Franklin J. Schaffner and he went on to go and make uh, Papillon with Steve McQueen and George C. Scott's World War II epic movie Patton. The film was backed by 20th Century Fox with a 5.8 million budget which was quite a big budget back in 1968 I believe but it went on to go and make $32 million at the box office. It was a smash hit which spawned a massive franchise. It was the first of five films in a series, which all went on to go and do well. So you had um, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, uh, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, Conquest, and Battle of the Planet of the Apes. And the film was so big back in 1968 that it was one of the first movies in Hollywood to actually spawn merchandise on a big scale. You had toys and comics and I think if you can get hold of some of this merchandise today I think it's worth quite a lot of money. And then with the success of the sequels which all had a place uh, number one when they released and they all made their money back um, at quite a big scale as well. Uh, you had a TV series, I think you had a cartoon series. Um, it was remade by Tim Burton. I don't think that was as good but I don't think it did too bad. Um, and then of course you've got the films that have come out or more recently starting with I think it was Rise of the Planet of the Apes which I think came out in 2011 and the recent one is Dawn of the Planet of the Apes I believe and I think there's another one that's going to be made. I think the I think they're planning to make like a, a type of remake of um, Planet of the Apes with um, Taylor and the Icarus landing because in Rise of the Planet of the Apes in 2011, you actually see the spacecraft take off before the infection takes place on the planet Earth. So, I'm all for that actually. I wouldn't mind seeing a retelling of this film. That's quite unusual for me. But I think with the new retelling of this franchise, I think they've done it quite well when it comes to remakes as such. So, um, 
I'm all for that. The film has an amazing soundtrack by the legendary Jerry Goldsmith. It's a very haunting soundtrack to the film. And he is known for other classic movies such as Star Trek, Alien and Gremlins, just to name just a few. And let's have a look at the cast of this film. So obviously you've got the legendary, iconic Charlton Heston in this film. He plays Taylor. He plays it really good in this film. Get off me, you damn dirty ape. <laughs> He's brilliant. Uh, another legend, uh, Roddy McDowell as Cornelius, uh, Kim Hunter as Sarah, Morris Evans as Dr. Zayas. <laughs> I think a few people, when they say Dr. Zayas, they think of The Simpsons. And uh, Linda Harrison as Nova. Just so that's just some of the cast to name, just a few. So let's have a talk about the production of this film and how the Planet of the Apes got to Hollywood. So it was originally a it's a book by Pierre Bull. It's a French author. And he wrote The Planet of the Apes in 1963. And this book was picked up by Rod Serling from The Twilight Zone. And he originally wanted to make a adaption of this book into a short story for an episode of The Twilight Zone. And whilst he was writing the episode, he thought it was that good that he'd thought he'd make it into a film. So he was actually going to make it Twilight Zone the movie and have this as the main plot. And in the actual book, I think the apes are very advanced, very advanced civilization. And I think Rod Serling's adaptation would have been very expensive to make. So Serling came away from the project. Blake Edwards even picked this up to have a look at. Um, he put it back down again. And then it went to the guy who did direct his film, Franklin J. Schaffner, who picked it up. And he took a look at the story and he thought I could probably make it as a less advanced um, society for the apes and then of course made the production a lot cheaper. So the filming went ahead, it took about three months to make this film. Uh, they filmed in locations in the Arizona desert and Lake Powell. And then when the film was released, like I say, it was a commercial success and it was liked by the critics and the critics picked up on the actual makeup effects and techniques which were groundbreaking at the time. And it still holds the record to this day for the most makeup effect artists to be on set. And I think it was about 80 altogether makeup effects artists. And throughout the whole franchise, like I say, up until this day, they still hold that record because I suppose today they use um, CGI. Things are a little bit more easier. But back then, that would have been groundbreaking. And then on top of the special effects, uh, more importantly, you've got a really good story here as well. Um, and the acting by Charlton Heston is, you know, it's phenomenal. He does a really good job of it. He's really gritty. Um, there's a real sense of dread in this film, I think. I mean, when I watched it first back in 1987, um, you know, I was watching films like Star Wars, all the Corman movies and that Battle Beyond the Stars. So... I remember watching this um, in the summer of 87, one afternoon, it came on TV. I thought it was just going to be another sci-fi film. I came away it, 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 with a certain type of dread, that's how I felt, for the Taylor character being left on this planet. And let's be honest with it here, it's, it's a borderline horror movie, isn't it really? You know, because all those things that Taylor goes through when he gets imprisoned... Um, he gets shot in the throat. One of his friends gets stuffed and put into a museum. One of his friends has his brain cut out. And you, I was watching this film back in 87 thinking, oh my God. And then I, I thought, there's going to be a good ending here with this film, isn't there? You know, something's going to work out with Taylor. He's going to be able to get in his spaceship and get away. No, he doesn't. <laughs> it's like... You know, you think, he's on a beach, what's going to happen, what is it? And that bit at the end, I mean, everybody knows the ending, I imagine, it's a spoiler alert, but that bit, when he goes up to the Statue of Liberty on the beach, is haunting. It was haunting. It's, I still remember it now, thinking, oh my God. And then it just closes with him going, God damn, you all to hell. And it's like, what have I just watched? And even though I was haunted, I was fascinated at the same time, probably the same way that I'd watched um, films like Jaws 
and Raiders of the Lost Ark and Close Encounters and Star Trek and Star Wars. So, um, Planet of the Apes is part of the building block for my love of cinema and I'm sure it is for everybody else and it really does deserve its place on the um, Hollywood's, you know, Hall of Fame. Um, so yeah, all in all, it is iconic. And then talking about Charlton Heston, you know, he's great in this film. He comes out with some great lines. I'm sure some of them are probably ad-libbed as well. Um, his style of acting is brilliant, but it was also helped, believe it or not, by he was suffering with a cold or something like that. He was, he was suffering with a fever. And um, Charlton Heston even went on to go and say this really helped me um, get into the role of that character as a sort of dishevelled prisoner that was, you know, shaking and sweating and all that sort of stuff. So what you see there on screen is actually Charlton Heston suffering. And um, he wasn't the only choice for the Taylor character. He also had Sean Connery, Steve McQueen and Paul Newman. All great actors. If they did it, we probably wouldn't know anything else. But to be honest with you now, I couldn't really see it without um, Charlton Heston. He is the he is the man in the apocalypse because he, he would later go on to do the Amiga Man, which is pretty much the same character, but in um, a different environment dealing with now is it zombies or vampires mm, I'll have to have a look into that and whilst we're talking about trivia here there's a little bit more here I've mentioned most of it along the way already um, but you had the director used um, odd skewed camera angles to create disorientating effect and Charlton Heston in another film called The Warlords where he plays a knight actually requotes his famous line from this movie in a different type of way where he says god damn dirty armor so <laughs> it's pretty cool so there you go guys that is a roundup of how we got the planet of the apes and all in all as a roundup it's a successful franchise everybody seems to like these films it's very iconic um I was talking about the toy franchise and all that sort of stuff and the one-liners and from Charlton Heston and everything. So, yeah, all in all, it's done very, very well. So, let's have a look at... Um, let's do a bite-sized review of this film then. Let's have a look at The Planet of the Apes. So, the film starts off in space and you introduce to astronauts Taylor, Landon and Dodge who are in deep hibernation and their spaceship crashes into a lake on an unknown planet. After the crash, they find that their fourth crewmate has died, and that's a real creepy scene as well. You know, it's all like mute, body all mutilated. That's just start off a 10 for this film. And before Taylor leaves the ship, he has a look on the uh, time date, and he finds out that they have travelled 2,006 years into the future from 1972. After escaping from the ship, they set off across a desolate wasteland where they come across some eerie scarecrow-like figures around the edge of a canyon. And then so after walking through the wasteland, they decide to go for a swim and this is where they have all their supplies and clothes taken from mute, primitive humans. And in order to try and get their supplies back, they chase after them through a cornfield and then this is where the apes turn up and... They chase him through the cornfield, Taylor gets shot through the neck, one of the other astronauts gets shot and the last remaining astronaut Landon gets um, knocked unconscious. Taylor is then taken to the ape city and this is where he meets Zira and she has saved him by giving him a blood transfusion but at this time Taylor can't talk, he's now mute. He then gets put into a prison cell with a female primitive human and he calls her Nova. And whilst he's spending time with the apes, he oversees everything and he sees that the gorillas have become like the army, uh, the orangutans have become like the government and the council and the chimpanzees have become like the scientists and the doctors. And whilst the ape society is much like the human society, um, they nonetheless treat the humans as the primitive race where they hunt them down, they kill them, they enslave them or they use them for scientific work. Taylor then convinces Sarah that he is intelligent by writing on a piece of paper and she takes an interest in him with her fiancé Cornelius which is the Roddy McDowell character. But then Dr Zeus finds out of his intelligence and he wants to castrate Taylor and because of this Taylor manages to escape and then this is where he gets captured by the apes 
and he comes out with that classic line, Get your dirty paws off me, you stinking dirty ape. <laughs> it's a classic line. Oh, and there's a bit I forgot to mention. He actually finds one of his um, crewmates who's in the museum and he's been stuffed. So when I was talking earlier about this film being a borderline horror movie, you got it right there. Oh, and his other crewmate had his brain cut out. So there you go, guys. That just about tops it. So <laughs> me watching this back in 1987, man. So Taylor realises that he is in a bad place and he needs to escape and Dr Zaios is not letting off more than he knows because of Taylor talking he realises that he is from a race of people who can actually talk. The people from the Forbidden Zone which you later find out in Beneath the Planet of the Apes and Escape from the Planet of the Apes. So Zaius is trying to look after the integrity of the ape city and he doesn't want everybody to know about these um, humans that can talk. So at this point Zira and Cornelius realise um, Taylor's fate and because they like him they help him escape and Taylor escapes to the Forbidden Zone to try and find out about the simian race and the evolution and he tries to prove that he is an astronaut and he is not from this planet. So then uh, Cornelius and Taylor, they arrive at a cave in the Forbidden Zone. Before they arrive there, Dr. Zeus turns up with a group of ape soldiers. And this is where you get a standoff between Taylor and the apes. And eventually, Taylor manages to take Zeus and puts a gun to his head. And he warns off the other apes. And then Dr. Zeus, he comes out and says that he agrees to take Taylor to the cave. Whilst in the cave, Taylor comes across a pair of glasses and a talking children's doll. And then this is where Zeus comes out and says to Taylor, he says he's always known about possible human civilization. But at this point, Taylor still doesn't think that he's on Earth. And he goes away and says, I need to still go and find out answers. I need to find out where I am. But before um, Taylor rides off on horseback, and he's with Nova at this time as well, and he departs from Zira and Cornelius, who go back to the ape city. Dr. Zeus says to uh, Taylor, he warns him, he says, Whatever you're about to go and find, you aren't going to like it. And then Taylor rides off along the shoreline. And you know what happens here, guys? That's right, you get that really eerie, iconic scene where Taylor's riding along the shoreline. He stops in astonishment. You don't actually see what he's looking at. He walks up to it very slowly. You get a really good, some really good camera angles here, some good shots. You see a little spike of the Liberty head headdress, and there you go, guys. That's it. It's the Statue of Liberty, the iconic scene. Taylor realizes that he's on the planet Earth after a nuclear war, some sort of conflict, and he falls down into the sand and he iconically comes out and says god damn you god damn you all the hell and that's it that's it guys that's it just the end of the film it's just it's bleak you think oh my god poor old taylor is stranded on a planet full of apes and there you go cuts into the end credits and that's the end of the movie and I've sometimes wondered this, if the Planet of the Apes wasn't successful and we didn't get a sequel, we didn't get a franchise and this was a standalone film, would we now as fan of the, fans of this film, being like a cult film, say, well, what would happen to Taylor? Would be, there'd be loads of fan theories and possibilities and stuff like that. And a little bit like, um, like the end of the thing, you know, was it Charles? Was it McCready? Same sort of thing, you know, how does Taylor get off this planet? What happens to him? What's his fate? So I guess in some ways I'm just saying that's just the power of cinema sometimes, you know. But as it turned out, there was a sequel and it's quite a good sequel. Be uh, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, I quite like that one. It's quite good. So there you go, guys. Planet of the Apes it is iconic. Um, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. If you have seen it, um, I no doubt say that you're probably a fan like me. It's a decent film. Um, I appreciate it's probably not everybody's cup of tea, you know, not into sci-fi or this particular sort of genre, but it is, as a roundup, a really good, steady, solid movie. So there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. And talking about iconic sci-fi, um, I'm going to be back. My next episode is going to be the cult classic. It's probably one of the massive building blocks for any sort of sci-fi movie. Is the Forbidden Planet from... Oh, I think that might have been done in the 50s, 1958 early 60s something like that but i will be taking a look at that um 
Les Leslie Nielsen doing a straight roll before he got into the comedy of the naked gun and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that. And a little bit of admin for the show, guys. I am a proud member of the Legion podcast, so go and check out all the other shows there. And I'll play a promo at the end of this show. And you can find By Size Cinema on iTunes, on YouTube, and there's several other players on the internet you can find the show. And um, check out the Facebook page as well. You can find me on there. So there you go, guys. Um, keep it bite size. Keep it safe. And I'll see you soon. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. <laughs>